Now, he's been preaching the gospel for 42 years at the same congregation, the Austin Road Church in Sugarland, Texas. And, uh, you know, I, I asked him if that was some kind of record. And he said, well, he didn't know for sure, but he's the only preacher they've ever had. And he never preached on how to fire a preacher. So <laughs> I don't guess they know any better. So uh, he'll probably be there a good while longer, hopefully so. Uh, he, of course, is the director of the Florida College Dry Creek Camp and beloved by many of our, our students here on campus. And certainly as we were drawing up the uh, lecture topics and we wanted to uh, certainly uh, devote a session talking about the role of the single Christian and what that means. And uh, we could think of no one more uh, qualified and suited uh, to ably do a, a great job with that than John Kilgore. And so again, I commend him to your attention this morning. From holy sex to being single. <laughs> holy moly. <laughs> but there is a connection. Single people have an enormous stake in the success of marriage. And nothing that I say today, I want to be understood that I'm opposed to marriage. I favor it. I'm here from two godly parents who lived their whole life, 62 years, in service to one another. How many singles do we have here? Let's see. See the hands of the single folk that are proud of it, or at least the. Well, how many of you? Keep your hands up. I want to see how many single people we have. Well, how many of you plan to remain single? <laughs> That's the issue. Is it a fate worse than death? We want to talk about that. Being single for a life is usually not a happy thought for the young. It's not necessarily a happy thought for the not so young. I did not start my life thinking of living alone. I thought I would be married and have lots of kids. I grew up in a home of a minimum of six people and a maximum of nine people. And in my earlier life, we had two bedrooms and one bath. It was wonderful. We had a wonderful home. Living a single, as a single person this long was not planned. One of the most asked questions of me as I travel, when they get to know me a little bit better and feel like it will not be too private, is, why didn't you ever marry? The only answer I know to give, I'm just inept. Just think of that. From ineptitude has qualified me to speak on this subject of failure. <laughs> but there's a message there. Often our failures, and I don't really consider it as that, but often our failures can become one of our biggest assets. Do you believe in the power of God to take things that possibly we would not have planned or even have wanted and make them into one of our greatest gifts to our world. If you don't, you don't believe in the cross. The worst thing that the devil ever did is the best thing that ever happened to us. That's the power of God. And I want to emphasize to all of you who are single and married, God is powerful. And he could take either a married life or a single life and use it to his glory and make something of our lives. And who knows? I may disqualify myself yet and get married. 
But I will tell you up front, being single or married is not the highest priority of my life, nor do I think it ought to be the highest priority of your life. Devotion to God is. And I hope to hit that several times as we work through the lesson. For most people, being single is the road less traveled and in some ways the more difficult road, especially in our over-sexualized culture that we now live in. But for many of us, it is an essential road in view of the realities of life. There are just more women than there are men. If we do take out the fact that the prisons are dominated by men, you have even less for women to choose from. Those are the realities. It therefore is inevitable that there are going to be some who will not be married. And add to that Christian or biblical teaching that teaches us that there are some situations where the biblical injunction is remain single. I believe that. I do not construe or understand what God has said about marriage to ultimately say that no one has to remain single. I don't understand that. I believe the Bible says that. There will be situations where the only option for us to remain true to God is to live a single life. Our title, which is to the unmarried, recovering Christian friendship for singles, our title suggests that we can recover the concept and practice of Christian friendship. We can help those who are single. And I might add, if we can recover the concept of Christian friendship, we can help all of us. All of us can be helped. I want to read now our introductory text. I'm taking it from Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. One of the most uh, used passages at a marriage ceremony, but I don't know that you could exclusively say it's talking about marriage. I think it's talking about the human predicament that we all are in. It reads, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is no, not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. The wise writer of Ecclesiastes understood well the wisdom of building a network of friends that could stand with you to resist the various pressures and various challenges that we all have in life. The text really deals with physical things. But I suggest to you it is also true in the spiritual and emotional realm that we need others to stand with us. I want to bring this home to you in somewhat of a not as effective way if we were all in the same congregation locally. But I think it will be at least suggest to you the idea. Just looking around this room here, do we need these people in order to go to heaven? You say, well, not really, because that's ultimately just between me and God. Well, there's truth in that. But what do the scriptures say? Do you think any of us are going to make it just all by ourselves? Just going solo, spiritually, emotionally? Are we going to be able to do that? Are you so strong that you don't think you'll ever fall or need encouragement from some other brother or sister? Someone who cares about you, knows about you, knows you intimately? I think we're kidding ourselves, and God knew that as well, and I hope to bring that out in our lesson. 
We need another with whom to walk and grow. And if we are, if we're ever to reach our highest potential of spiritual living, we're going to need a horde of people around us, a cadre, a family of brothers and sisters. Our present culture has some trends that I think work against close friendships. Now in this, I'm speaking mostly to the younger ones among us, but not exclusively. I'm going to talk about the use of this. Oh, I just got a notification here. Let me check. (laughs) I was listening to an ex-Google executive who was instrumental in devising how websites and cell phones work. And his team wanted to find a way that would be addictive, that would cause people to immediately check their phone. And they came up with, bing. Or if it's a text, bang. He said that the average person checks their phone 151 times a day. I couldn't believe it. I read once a book written by a doctor, uh, um, an MIT technology professor. Uh, This was a woman who was charged with the task of integrating the faculty and the students over the internet. It was going to be so lovely and everybody was going to stay connected, etc., etc. And here was her conclusion. We're the most connected people in the history of the world. And likely the most lonely. Why is that? Connected. Instantaneously. I can talk to somebody in China right now. Well, it's kind of demonstrated. It really hit me one time when I carried, there were about 40 kids who wanted to visit Falcon Days. So we decided to raise the money and we were going to fly them all over here in the fall to attend Falcon Days. And I was leading the troop. And I was thinking, boy, this is going to be a wonderful time for bonding and everybody getting to know one another if we're going to travel over there. And it was a wonderful group to travel with, all wonderful kids. Of course, everyone had a cell phone, which is, you know, I have one and I use it all the time. So we had been here at the college for the couple of days and now we're headed back to the to Houston and we're sitting in the airport at Tampa waiting to board our flight and I'm thinking this will be a marvelous time to kind of everybody share what they've learned and everybody be talking and everything and everyone without exception looking at their phone it's kind of interesting to sit around a dinner table where everybody's looking at their phone The result is, in my judgment, skills of conversation, of communication, are not being learned. I grew up in an era, of course, and I'm older than I realize at times, where the large amount of entertainment was sitting around talking. And as a young person, I love to sit where the old folks or the older people sat and to hear the stories, the humor, the insight, listening to the radio, all the family around that. That's a bygone era, isn't it? We, likely we will not see that again in our lifetime. But it makes me nostalgic for times where we just sit and talk. And I've lost some of that skill as well of being able to, which I don't know what to say. We run out of conversation just pretty quickly. 
We noticed this at our Dry Creek camp, and we came up with the idea that we would have a cell-free zone for a week. We decided we wouldn't take them up, but put everybody on their honor. And we declare a cell phone, phone free zone from Sunday night when they get there until Saturday morning when they leave. We got kids going through withdrawal symptoms. I'm telling you. It's withdrawal. It's addictive. The people and makers of these phones and the websites know how to get our attention and know how to addict us to the notification or this. I've just got to check. i got to know who's calling. Normally at camp, it takes until about Tuesday evening for all the newbies to get into the flow meeting new people, becoming friends. But if they do, if they buy into this culture that's only for a week, we got them. They'll be back every year. And I've seen it now for 41 years. This coming summer will be my 42nd year. It works. Putting aside the technology and just talking. We even started a little activity during craft activity time. We call it story time. And we have a woman there who is a wonderful storyteller. She's in her early 90s. She has a lifetime of stories. And she just invites them in to her sitting area there. And they all sit around and they talk. And they tell stories. I wish every child wanted to go. But this is our attempt for them to make contacts. contacts. Carl Jung, Swiss psychologist, said this, the meeting of two personalities is like the contact of two chemical substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. And I want to tell you, a part of my story is the transformation of me on this campus and working for this school. For me, Florida College has been instrumental in providing a place and an atmosphere for transformed via friendship. Many of my closest friends are connected to this college. This arguably, and maybe unarguably, is the college's greatest work. And I know I'm eternally grateful for all the friends that I've accumulated through this college. But now I want to tell you my story. My story has three points. Each point is a major challenge that I have found in living the single life for Christ. Then for each challenge, I want to connect our Christian friendship helped me and I think will help you. The three points are feelings of failure, value and acceptance, the need for value and acceptance. The second one is aloneness and loneliness, the need for companionship. And the last, which is usually the elephant in the room, yes, it's about celibacy, the need for intimacy. I'll save that one for last. Certainly, I want this audience and anybody who knows me that I do not consider myself an expert on being single in any way. I'm experienced, but I'm not necessarily an expert. I'm too much a work in progress to be the guide, the ultimate guide for anyone. Fortunately, we have two other bachelors who are eminently qualified. They are... Jesus and Paul. Now think about that for a moment. That's got to say something about living single in a successful way. Jesus and Paul. And reluctantly, we will allow at least one married man, Peter, 
and I take it John was married, even though I have no evidence to, to say, we're going to let them have a few words to say just so that we got balanced. I remember I was talking to a Roman Catholic friend, and I mentioned that Peter was married. She said, are you sure about that? I don't believe that our church teaches that he never married, that he was, he was single all his life. What's the evidence that he was married? And I said, well, the Bible says that he had a mother-in-law, and it seems to me a bit unfair to get a mother-in-law and, and not a wife. <laughs> Now, every time I tell that joke, everybody laughs. I don't get it. Every mother-in-law I have had has been wonderful. <laughs> and my friend, which may be more revealing than he wished, said, I get your point. <laughs> so let's talk about feelings of failure, the need for value and acceptance. You know, living in a single Living as a single in a couple's world, and especially a couple's church, can do a number on your sense of belonging. Where do I fit in? We're having baby showers, and we're having wedding showers, and we're having lessons after lessons on how to live as a married couple as we're having this week. And maybe you, sitting out there as a single person, thinking, wow, when are they going to address my situation? Well, here I am. That's what the purpose of it is. And I want you to know, I began to ask that question myself. You know, when you're in your early 20s, you think, oh, well, I'll be married. I plan, you know, I thought that it would happen. You know, it'll be in another two or three, four or five years. You know, I hit 31, decided I wanted to preach, and so I began to preach. Well, yeah, you know, I had people advise me, John, you need to leave this little church where you are. You need to move to a place like Nashville where there are a lot of churches, where there are more girls for you to consider to be married. And I said, and when I go there, if it doesn't happen, do I move again? And then at some point, you think, you know, this likely is just not going to happen. Don't have anything against it, but likely it's not. This is the way it's going to be. And is that all right? Even though normally our churches are dominated by married couples, for the first time since these statistics have been gathered, listen, I didn't know this until I researched it, Single adults in America now outnumber married adults. So, those of you who are single, we're living in a singles world now. And that's good and bad. It's good in the sense that possibly there will be more, so, more uh, greater population with, from whom to select friends and mates. But it's bad when we understand why there are more single adults today than ever before since we've been measuring them. More singles are living outside of marriage is one reason. Singles are waiting longer to marry, many looking for their soulmate, often defined by worldly standards. We have bought heavily into the romance myth of the one perfect soulmate for me for my life. That there's one. I believe it's a myth. Divorce is more frequent than in earlier years. So we have divorced people now who are living singly. So for the Christian who wishes to marry a spiritually, scriptural, married person, what are we going to do? They're just not enough to go around. Some of us are going to live singly as a single person all of our lives. You know, on a side note, I speak to all of you who are movers and shakers in your local churches, you elders, preachers. Churches who want to grow will need to learn how to better meet the needs of this greater single population. There are more of them than ever before. The prospects are exciting for developing a more devoted adult workforce who have both the time, energy, and resources to devote to spiritual work. 
Now, likely our churches are going to have to get rid of some of the stereotypes that surround single people and living single. And maybe we need more lessons on how to do that. It'd be open to the single person who wants to be a part of us. Let's speak for a moment about a church dominated by married couples. I am not against it. I'm for it. It's God's plan. This is not a bad thing, but it usually produces a dearth of teaching about living single and a general attitude, often felt but not spoken, of married is good and single is not as good. Unattached means what's wrong with you? And I know you must be miserable. So let me fix you up with my cousin. <laughs> People ask me, John, do you mind if I kind of look around for a wife for you? I said, have at it. <laughs> I am the example of the failure of brotherhood projects. And I ask you parents, see the hands of the parents that are in the audience. All of, many of you, I'm going to ask you this question. How many parents want their children to never marry? Or bear grandchildren? Well, isn't that our job? We're to bear grandchildren, to please our parents, so that they have some little ones around again. These statements express common attitudes in and out of the church and the culture in which we live. It affects us whether we are take, talking about marriage or the dating or the older person, dating, or, uh, dating for the younger and marriage for the older. To have a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend says what? I'm okay. Somebody wants me. And often we wear it as a badge of honor. I must be okay because I have someone who wants to spend their life with me. But wait a minute. Does everyone who is married or has a boy or girlfriend feel valued or accepted? Hardly. Oh, that it were so. Can you be single and feel good about yourself? To not feel like a failure? Certainly you can. Our sense of real value should have very little to do with our physical circumstances. I want you to understand what I'm saying here. I think this is a much missed uh, principle. This, this formed the basis of a whole series of lessons that we taught at camp. Can you feel good about yourself that it's in a way that is separate from your circumstances? If you can't. You're in for a roller coaster emotional ride in life because your circumstances are going to change. In a class of adults, and this, this case was all women, I asked them, who are you? And almost to a woman, they said, I am the wife of so-and-so, so-and-so. Well, that's a good thing, but does that really say who you are? What if your husband dies? Are you now a nobody? We need to, to, to put our foundations for who we are, not in circumstances, but God himself. We are his children. We belong to him. So how can we overcome these feelings of failure and low sense of value and acceptance? God. Devotion to God. Be a child of God. He came to take failures and nobodies like me and like you and to turn us into important, precious people with the power of the divine nature in us. Listen to this from Peter, 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. 
seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Wow. I can become a partaker of the divine nature. He's not talking about the nature with which we were created, created in his image. He's talking about being like God in his character, in his, in his holiness, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Because of who we are, children of God, our sense of value and acceptance comes from him, and he will never abandon us, never disappoint us, always be there. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We gladly hear that. In essence, it means, especially when you compare the Matthew account of this very statement, putting him first. He is our prime devotion and our prime care and our prime desire. Even family is second. And then we also gladly accept our Lord's teaching, which even his own first disciples found it hard to accept. From Matthew 19, 9 through 12. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. If you can't get out of it, it'd be better not to get in it. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Well, who are they? Are they the ones that just happen to have a very low libido? They're not motivated strongly by sexual desire. Who can accept this statement? The world can't. And it appears that many of our brethren can't accept it. No. Who is able to accept this command? Only those to whom it has been given, he says. Well, who are they? They are the ones like the disciples that came asking Jesus for an explanation when he spoke the parable of the sower. Jesus replied, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. It was granted to all who really wanted to know and who were willing to alter their life accordingly. So, in this case, the ones to whom this is given and who can accept it are those who are being partakers of the divine nature. And thus, children of God are empowered to choose to forego marriage 
for the greater good of the kingdom. For the greater good. Listen to Paul. And I believe this is in the background of his teaching from 1 Corinthians 7. And it's already been referred to today more than I will. But I say the 7, verse 8, then I'm going to skip to 25. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. Why would Paul give that advice? Skip all the way down to verse 35. This I say for your own benefit, in view of the present distress, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to God. Is that a good? Would we be willing to forego marriage for an undistracted devotion to God? The ultimate purpose of life for both men and women is not to be married and have children, but to glorify God. And we need to glorify God when we marry and have children. All men and women can do that, scripturally married or single. In some cases, being single, in some cases, being single is the only way that you could glorify God. This is a hard saying for our culture, which many in and out of the church do not accept. Many have accepted the prevailing fallacy that to not marry and enjoy sexual privileges is a fate worse than death. And it's counter to their nature. And no loving person would ever teach and insist upon them remaining single. And we're reluctant to even tell people that because we often, even the married, see that as a fate worse than death. This fallacy misses the point of human existence. It settles for a state less than what God intended for us. Certainly being married is to be held in high esteem, and most people will do well to choose it. But marriage is not the panacea often imagined in our culture. Not even marriage between two Christians. The ultimate in life is to be devoted to God, whether one is married or single. Therefore, really, this lesson is for all of us, pointing us to ultimate devotion to God. Well, who can help us in this undistracted devotion to God? Our Christian friends. I look out into this audience at people that I have known here and others of you who live far away and I've been privileged to travel this country over these 40 years and be in your homes to be received by you as a friend. I want you to know something. You have saved my life. The Lord and you have become my salvation as far as my ability to work and to help people. But think about the church that God assembled. It is a one another society. Just take the little phrase, one another, and use your concordance to run the references. And I'm going to, to read off these. And if you want to, you can say one another. That's the common phrase in each of these statements, biblical statements. If you want all the scriptural references, they're in the book. Go by the book. And they're all there. But I want you to get a flavor of this one another relationship. If when you do, you will understand better what really is Christian friendship. Regard is more important, 
one another. Same mind toward, if you want to join me, one another. Subject to, judge not, show tolerance for, preferring an honor, some ca same care for, build up, be hospitable to, live in peace with, serve, comfort, Seek after that which is good for, speaking truth to, kind, tender-hearted, forgiving, sparing with, wait for, greet, speaking to, stimulate, teaching and admonishing, praying for, and watch this one, confessing sins to. You got a friend like that? I do. And I want one for you too. I offer myself. I got room for one more friend. And one more friend. And one more friend. Christian friend. All walking together, Christ knew that we needed to be in this society. And I hope you will take this message and help your local church if they don't have, if they're not getting it. And their concept of church is just show up at a building, sing some songs, have a prayer, take the Lord's Supper, hear a sermon, possibly, and then out. Becoming a family. Listen to the Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. We need friends that we will take wounds from who will help us. Laura McCure, she's an online blogger, wrote this. There is nothing like the razor-sharp tongue of a good friend to cut through the lies we tell ourselves. I have friends like that that I'm accountable to. I need that. You see, I don't have a wife to be accountable to. One brother said, John, it must be great that you don't have to answer to a wife. I said, brother, don't you realize I'm answering to 150 women in our church. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. Look at this familiar text. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Every time we sing one of those songs, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work, we'll work. Not I work, you'll work, he'll work, she'll work, but we'll work. We're talking to one another. We're teaching, we're reminding one another that we need to work. And for how long? Till Jesus comes. He ain't come yet. So we need to keep on working. Paul defends his apostleship. Now note this one. This has been one of the hardest concepts to teach in camp that I've ever encountered. It's being jealous with a godly jealousy over your Christian friend. Do you believe in that? That we need to stand accountable to our Christian friends who need to exercise a godly jealousy over our talents, our time, our resources, who we are. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, Paul writes, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by, her, by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. 
For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. You got any brothers and sisters who bear it beautifully, accepting error on various things? They don't seem to mind. No big deal. Godly jealousy. That's a friend. And we'll let Grandma Duggar have the last word in this section. She wrote, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. There's a lot of truth in that. And then let's deal with aloneness and loneliness. They're not the same. Just because you're alone doesn't mean you're lonely. And you can be lonely in a multitude of people. Someone here. God knew from the beginning that it was not good for us to go solo. So he prepared Eve to take that role. But I want to emphasize that the opportunity as single people today after day to pretty well what we want to do without considering the desires and needs of other people can be very, a very intoxicating recipe for spiritual death. I live alone and have for these, well, wow. More than 50 years. Oh, I take that back. Dewey lives with me. He's my cat. The kids think that is hilarious at camp. Here we got a director who's never been married and lives with a cat. So at any rate, but he's a great companion. Aloneness, loneliness, companionship. But all, you see, you're not there. I can watch whatever program I want, unless Dewey wants to watch another program, and then I normally yield to him. But you see, I can just pretty well do what I want. Is that good for me? I tell you it's not. I need to put myself into situations and relationships where I accommodate other people, serving them, serving them. Single people, we need to get out of ourselves and into the lives of others as servants. It's the greatest antidote to loneliness. Yes, you will be alone. Many people cannot stand to eat by themselves. That doesn't bother me. In fact, to be quite honest with you, I like aloneness. And yes, at times I do get lonely. But companionship and service to others is what we are advocating as the antidote. Let's read a little bit from Philippians 1, 1 through 11. Paul writes, you know, what kind of a letter would you write if you were thrown into prison for preaching the gospel? You're writing to your friends back home. What would you say? I think I'd say, get me out of here. Come visit me. I need this. Look what Paul writes. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Even in these extreme situations, he has the ability through the relationships that he has established in Christ to remember people. And when he remembers them, he thanks God. Are there people in the world that when they remember you, thank God? There are a host of people, many of whom are in this audience, that when I think of you, I thank God. And what was the reason that he was so grateful, able to thank God? Because of their participation in the gospel. He, they were serving others together. Do 
doing, reaching, serving. Well, what are we going to get out of it? Then Peter said to him, Matthew 19, 27 through 29, Peter said to him, Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you will sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. Yes, the sword of truth that Jesus wields separates families. Some of you probably are separated from your own physical families. And even in your singlehood, you're also cut off from your own biological family. Don't go without a family. Everybody needs a family. Everybody needs sons and daughters, grandsons, granddaughters. Everybody needs mothers and fathers. And if you don't care who you help, you can help a lot of people. I told you that in the beginning, I always thought that I would marry and have lots of kids. Well, I got lots of kids. I just never bothered to get married. Now, before you turn that, I don't know the thousands of kids now that I have served. And I don't tell you that for my aggrandizement. I'm just telling you. They've helped save my life. There are a lot of kids out there who need a father. I want to sign up for that. I want to do that. I want to see him come here. And hopefully, providence prevailing, find a mate. I visited one of my daughters two weeks ago. She's got two little babies, a year and three months. They're my grandkids. You want to see their picture? I'll show them to you. I'm proud of her. And then let's finally, in the time that remains, talk about the elephant in the room, celibacy. I was in the mall. I rarely ever go to the mall. You know I had to be bored that day. But at any rate, I was in the mall. I had to pick up some shoes, and I got those, and I was waiting on some trousers to be hemmed. And so I was just walking in, as in probably your mall. They have these kiosks where the young ladies come out and give you something free. It's perfume. It's lotion. It's this. It's that. And, of course, that's just the beginning of there to sell you something. And this cute little gal came up and offered me, and I said, well, I really don't have any need for it, but I have something about her, maybe because she was cute. So I just said, I'll talk. So I talked with her, and she asked me, I asked her where was she from. She was from France, and et cetera. We kind of conversed, and I told her, you know, what I did. And, and she said, well, are you married? I said, no, I'm not married. I've never been married. You've never been married? And she said, how do you do that? I knew what she meant. How do you do that? By the power of God. Devotion to God. All men and women yearn for intimacy. I believe we come hardwired with the need to be intimate with people. The freedom that comes from being vulnerable, allowing someone to know our true selves, the person we are when the makeup comes off and the public face comes down. And they still love us. They still accept us. It is a liberating feeling. 
I believe this is the real joy and power of sex, to be intimate with a married partner in that way. But if it's only the flesh that is temporarily pleased and satisfied, we leave the deeper parts of us lonely and empty. So I want to talk to you about spiritual intimacy. Not sexual, but spiritual intimacy. Sharing ourselves, opening ourselves up Spiritual intimacy is when we are transparent, vulnerable, humble, gentle, courageous, honest, merciful, confident, understanding, accepting, caring, hopeful, trusting, trustworthy, and loving. Through Christ, these are all available to us. Friends, help us in our spiritual intimacy. How can I learn to be spiritually intimate with a being who is not here, who is not visible? How do I come spiritually intimate with God? Well, we have to learn the skills on one another. If anyone says, this is 1 John 4, verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his, own, hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. In initially reading that for so many years, I thought that was just opposite. How can I love you? God's easy. He isn't here. He's not making that many demands. But you are. But here it says, if I don't love you, I can't love him. And I realize that we can't do it because it's against his command. But I'm suggesting we can for another reason. And that is we haven't learned the skills of love, of godly love. And we learn those by practicing, if you will, on one another. Learning to trust, learning to be vulnerable, learning to be transparent, learning to be honest, learning to be loving. In conclusion, we can recover Christian friendship for singles and married alike when we realize and accept that no one of us is big enough in ourselves to be all that we want to be. Being single all my life, I have missed some things, some very beautiful, wonderful, important things. And sometimes when I think about those things, I get a little bit blue or down. My desire is that I may grow in Christ to the point that being single is one of the least important and least interesting facets of my life. The goal is to be a mature, perfected, balanced, and whole Christian, to be like him. In the final analysis, it really doesn't matter whether you have lived singly or married, but whether you have lived for him. It is good to be in the Lord with a single-minded devotion to him. I want to close this lesson by reading to you some lyrics of a song that I learned recently. It's called Flying Home. It is from the movie Sully. Maybe you've watched it's a recent movie. It's based, the movie is based on the true story of Captain Chelsea Sully Sullenberger, who on January the 15th, 2009, piloted U.S. Airway Flight 1549, which shortly after takeoff from LaGuardia Airport hit a flock of geese knocking out both engines. He then proceeded to make an emergency landing in New York's Hudson River. Miraculously, all 155 passengers and crew were saved. Flying home. Tell me your story. I'll tell you mine.
Sing me your song. I'll follow line by line. Draw me near. Let me hear the things you've treasured. Patient as falling snow, standing inside the questions, ever searching for what truths our souls are measured. Each of us rising from worlds unknown. Within your trials, I'll see my own. Still there are journeys that are yours alone. You were born for the storm you have to weather. True as a winter wind, you face the moment bravely. You and I, we're on our own. And yet, together, walking a path we can't define. Tell me your story. I'll tell you mine. Sing me your song, I'll follow line by line. Let the night fall with the lightness of a feather, trusting the coming dawn. We cannot hold the morning. You and I, we're on our own, yet together. For in the end, we're all flying home. Thank you.